Brussels, the capital of Belgium, home to 1.1 million people in a country of 11 million. But Brussels is not just the capital of Belgium, it is also the capital of the European Union. The main institutions representing the core of EU power are the European Parliament, the Commission, the Council and the EU Economic and Social Committee. The European Union is home to around 500 million citizens from 28 official member states and it is here where all the political decisions are made affecting Europe. Before we plunge into the main debate of UK's relationship with the EU, I want to go back briefly into the history of why Britain became drawn to the heart of European politics. Waterloo, the 18th of June, 1815. It was a battle between the two prominent figures, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and the British Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces, the Duke of Wellington. It was this battle that decided the future fate for Europe in the 19th century. The two prominent commanders, the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and the British Field Marshal, the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon's ambitions were to conquer Europe into a French Imperial Empire, and for the British, they wanted to preserve its independence and peace for Europe. It was this decisive battle that led to the ultimate victory for the Duke of Wellington and the crushing defeat for Napoleon Bonaparte. After Waterloo, it led to peace in Europe for 100 years, British military supremacy in the world, and the beginning of Britain's political relationship in Europe. But 99 years later, Britain was drawn into the First World War from 1914 to 1918, where most of the fighting was fought in the heartlands of Europe, in France and Belgium, and around 1 million British servicemen were killed. So I decided to come to Ypres, a small Belgium town that became one of the most iconic World War I battle sites, where British valour and sacrifice played a crucial role in the conflict. I went to visit museums like Hill 62, an authentic location to recapture what horrors these young men went through to protect this so-called fragile principle of democracy. For example, here in the preserved trenches of Ypres is a reminder of British blood spilt in the defence of democracy for Europe. Then there was the Second World War, from 1939 to 1945, where again Britain fought against Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler, who conquered the majority of Europe in the early stages of the war. After six long years of fighting, Britain and her allies, the USA and USSR, defeated Nazi Germany and liberated Europe. For example, here in Wallowis Saint Pierre, we have the statue of Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, who was one of the main figures who liberated Brussels on the 7th of September 1944. After the Second World War, it was the Belgian government who erected this statue of Monty in honour of him, and also acknowledging British involvement in the liberation of Belgium and Europe. It was after the Second World War that led to the creation of the European Community where the European Coal and Steel Community and the European Economic Community formed in 1951 and 1958 with the six countries Belgium, France, West Germany at the time, Italy, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. This European Union was an idea to bring collective unity and peace in Europe. Over the years, more nations joined this European community and it was not until 1973 when the UK, under the Conservative Prime Minister Ted Heath, joined the growing and stronger European superstate. But shortly afterwards, the UK held its first EU referendum under Labour leader Harold Wilson, who opposed the idea of Britain being part of the European organisation. It was known at the time as the Common Market Referendum, and there were two sides, the Yes campaign who wanted to stay, and the no, who wanted to leave the EU. On the 5th of June 1975, 
the Yes campaign won an overwhelming majority of 67% to 32 that allowed Britain to stay in the European community. Many thought that would end the disputes once and for all. However, over the years, the relationship between Britain and the EU faced many challenges. For example, Margaret Thatcher vetoed joining the European single market, the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, and Britain vetoed joining the Euro currency in 2004. And now, there is a second referendum, which will be held this year on the 23rd of June. This referendum will question Britain's fate over its EU membership. And what will be the result for this time round? There are two campaigns. One is the anti-European campaign known as Brexit, and the other, the pro-European side known as Bremain. With just over a few weeks to go, I decided to come to Brussels to meet the British expats living here and get their views on the referendum. There are currently 28,000 UK expats living in Belgium. However, most of them can't vote in this referendum. This is because the British government passed the 15-year law banning British expats who lived abroad for more than 15 years to vote in this referendum. Now it is the time to get some of their voices heard. Since you are a British uh, citizen, do you identify yourself as a British expat living in Belgium? Um, yes, definitely. Although we've been here so long, sometimes I almost feel like part of the furniture. But yes, we are expats. Uh, what made you decide to live a life in Belgium and not in the UK? Um, purely financial, economic migration. Paul was offered a job here and we came expecting to come for three years. But in fact, with various mergers and acquisitions of companies, we ended up staying 22 years. As you're aware, uh, there's going to be an EU referendum which will take place on the 23rd of June. It will decide the future freight for Britain's EU membership, whether we want to leave or stay in the European Union. Have you been following any of the recent debates so far on the news? Yes, I listen to Radio 4 every morning, so that coverage is quite good on there. I also listen to the BBC News and on the television. And then I hear things sometimes on Belgian radio, mostly when I'm driving my car. In the case of voting, there is a law for British expats, as you might know, that if they live more than 15 years outside the UK, they can't vote in this referendum. Are you legally allowed to vote? No, we're not, because we've been living here for 22 years. We've surpassed the 15 and we don't have a vote. Do you believe all British expats should have the right to vote, especially there are currently around 28,000 British uh, people living in Belgium at the moment? Yes, I definitely think we should have been offered the vote. As a British citizen, you have lived in a European country for a long time. In your perspective, from listening to arguments from Brexit and Remain campaigns, uh, where do you personally stand on this issue and why? Well, I think, um, along with a lot of other people, it's quite daunting getting yourself in a position where you feel that you know enough to actually make a decent decision. There is such a complex issue with important repercussions for our future. It's really difficult to know what the right thing is to do and I can be convinced by members of the Leave Europe campaign when I hear them speak sometimes and then I can listen to the other side and be convinced by them and I'm sure everybody feels the same. Um, personally I think there's a lot wrong with the European institutions and they need to be reformed but the overall idea of sticking together and being stronger together appeals to me. So I believe we should stay in, but there are problems with staying in, without a doubt. And I would like to see Europe reformed, and I suppose if you're at the table, you have a better chance of making a decision which will influence the outcome of the future. Whereas if you get out, you completely lost your influence and it's hard to see how Britain 
could be successful on its own if it's working against or working alongside a United States of America and eventually a United States of Europe. I think Britain will be rather small on its own against the United States of Europe. There is a great debate between the pro-European side and of course Brexit on how important the European Union is for the UK. As this is, this is an important issue for you personally, I would like to ask you if you are legally allowed to vote in this referendum. Well, um, the voting uh, criteria depends on how long you've been living abroad. If you've been living abroad for less than 15 years, you are allowed officially to vote. Uh, and uh, as, as you are in national elections, uh, <clears throat> um, and if you've been living abroad for longer than 15 years, then you're no longer entitled to vote. Uh, now, that's, that's, the British law in that respect is quite different from most European countries. Most European countries, it's a question of citizenship. It doesn't matter how long you've been living abroad. If you're still a citizen, you still have the right to vote. And that's, that, that, for almost all countries that I know of, apart from Britain, have that law. It's at least within, Europe, in, within Europe. In Italy's voting system, any Italian expat living in Belgium or France uh, can vote in their country's elections no matter how long they lived abroad. In your opinion, which of the two systems is fairer? Well, for, there's no question in my mind that uh, citizenship should be the qualifying factor. Uh, I find it, uh, it... It's sort of typically British, it's slightly undemocratic and it's really not... Uh, it's, it's based on purely pragmatic reasons. I mean, I, I did speak a number of years ago to a member of the government, a British uh, minister who was over here on visit, and he said, oh, well, yes, you know, it's a question of uh, foreign policy and, uh, um, after, after, and, and taxation, of course. And uh, if you don't pay taxes, then, you know, is it right that you should have the vote? Well, I mean, lots of people vote even though they don't work and don't pay taxes. My mother doesn't pay, my, my sister doesn't, because of various reasons, because they don't work, and, uh, and yet they still get to vote. And so, yeah, for me, it, it is no question that we should be like everybody else in Europe, and, and, and all citizens should have the right to vote. Yeah. As this is such an important issue for you personally, are you allowed to vote in this referendum? Um, it's a very important issue for me personally. I mentioned before that I'm looking forward to moving back to Wales. Um, <clears throat> how would this vote, if, for example, if we came out, how, how would that affect me moving back to Wales? I'm not sure. I mean, my partner's German and she, she likes Wales very much, but is that the decision we make? I mean, would there be serious economic repercussions if we left? I don't know. And I, it does worry me. Um, I am allowed to vote. Um, as a Welsh civil servant, I had uh, uh, a diplomatic post um, as part of the UK delegation to the EU, uh, mainly to make sure I paid tax back in Wales. <laughs> um, but since retiring, I've, I've now got uh, a postal vote, which I think is valid for 15 years. So I will vote, definitely. I am myself uh, British and can legally vote in this referendum after living there for four years, but I'm also half Italian. And being half Italian and have never lived in Italy at all, I can still vote in Italy's elections. So in terms of the Italian law, <coughs> any Italian expat who's lived outside of Italy can vote uh, in the country's elections no matter how far away they are from the country. So in your opinion, how Fair are the two systems. Right. Um, <clears throat> yes, I know a lot of expats living in, in Belgium. Um, some of them still c can vote, some of them can't because the 15 years has passed. Those people are very unhappy about that. And I, I think they should be. Um, as I say, I'm hoping to move back reasonably soon, so I don't think I'll be here for another 15 years. Um, but if, if I lost the right to vote, I'd be very upset about it. It's uh, it's a hard-won democratic right, and I think everybody should be allowed to vote, uh, wherever they are. I certainly will be voting. With the Welsh expats community based here in Brussels, or in Belgium, do you know anyone here who are worried about this referendum in terms of it might affect their jobs 
and lives at all? I certainly do. I know a lot of people are very worried about it. Um, people working in the EU institutions, in the Commission for example, there, there are Brits working in the Commission, there are Welsh people working in the Commission. I was chatting to a guy the other day from Aberystwyth and he's, he's really worried about it. I mean, if we leave the EU, what happens to his job? Does he have to, you know, does he have to leave the Commission? Nobody knows what's going on. That's the problem. Nobody knows what, what will happen in the future. And I know uh, another Welsh lady who set up a business here and she's really worried about it too. Yeah, they are worried, quite rightly. What do you think might happen if the referendum swings to the Brexit vote? Will there be a progressive change or a deterioration in Wales in terms of everything, so not just economy, in terms of the economy? Well, you don't really know, do you? I mean, people are coming out with these hypothetical ideas of what, about what will happen if we leave the EU and coming up with this crystal ball idea, it's all going to be wonderful, but they don't know. And people need to make their decision based on facts. Go out there and listen to people talking, go out there and read, get the, get the facts. Don't just guess about what's going on, get the facts. I mean, I talk to my kids about it, they say, oh, we're going to vote to leave. Why? Well, uh, because the papers say this and that and people, but they don't, once you give them the facts and once you talk to other people and say, these are the facts, this is the reality, then, you know, don't listen to crystal ball, just take the facts and base your decision on that. You have lived and worked in Brussels for a long time now and how many years have you been living here? I've been here for 20 years. Um, I originally came here in 1995, expecting that I would be here for a couple of years and then go back home to, to South Wales. Um, one thing led to another and I'm still here. In your professional career, what kind of roles have you accomplished so far here in Belgium? Well, I originally came here to work for um, a, a South Wales-based organisation on training, social policy, uh, support for the unemployed and, and things like that. And I was running international projects and getting financing for those projects from the European Union. Uh, then I worked for what's, what was called the Wales European Centre, which was a, a, a representation for all of the different organisations in Wales here in Brussels. Uh, and I did a variety of roles there, including regional policy, uh, environment, uh, and social policy. For the young viewers, can you please tell me what are the main goals of the British Chamber of Commerce in, in Brussels or Belgium, and what uh, kind of work do you do here? The British Chamber of Commerce here does two things. First of all, uh, it's been here a long time, and its original job was to facilitate trade and investment between the UK and Belgium. And Belgium is one of our largest international export markets. So we have, uh, we're amongst the top 10 of international export markets for, for the UK. And that's an important part of our role. But since the European Union has become more and more important to uh, the UK uh, and its day-to-day work, then that's become a more important part of our work. So now that's about two-thirds of our work and we're involved in uh, helping companies to understand the, the process of legislation and policy making uh, in the EU and to, uh, to make sure that they can uh, influence that, uh, that legislation so that it's going to help their companies to do their job. Can you explain to me what recent projects has the British Chamber has done so far for this year? The work that we've done this year has inevitably been a bit affected by the forthcoming referendum in the UK, so that's been an important part of our work. Our work here is principally not about campaigning in the UK, um, because uh, we're over here. There are plenty of people in the UK who have plenty to say about uh, the prospects for, for a referendum and, 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 uh, and how you should vote. But our work here is about um, making sure that people here in Brussels understand the arguments in the UK 
and what's going on. Since 1973, when the UK joined the European community, in your opinion, how much has it changed in the last 43 years or so? Well, I haven't been around for all of those 43 years. <laughs> at least I haven't been doing this kind of work and seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. But yeah, for the last 20 years, I've been seeing uh, the, the impact of the European Union. In simple terms, um, the the EU has changed, uh, has helped Britain change a lot in the last 20 years. Um, when Just before I came here, I was involved in a lot of work around the completion of the single market and there was a big uh, programme around 1992 which was about completing the single market. Um, now, in reality, there's still lots of work to do to complete the single market, but that's continued to have a big effect on the UK in terms of uh, jobs, growth, uh, uh, but also more generally opportunity. Uh, and what I've seen especially is a lot of young people having the opportunity to, to do new things, uh, things that wouldn't be possible for them uh, in the UK alone, to have new experiences by being able to come to Belgium or other parts of Europe to uh, do different kinds of work, um, to travel, to have holidays, to meet new people and the richness of that experience is probably the most important thing. As you're aware there is going to be an EU referendum which will take place on the 23rd of June. That will decide the future fate for Britain and on its membership in the European Union. What I want to ask you is, you are a British expat, can you legally vote in this referendum? Uh, I can't vote, uh, I've been here too long. Uh, you'll know that there's a rule um, about the period that you've spent outside of the UK uh, and when you're allowed to vote. Personally, um, for a long time, when I was originally a public employee in the UK, I was living and working here, but I was paying my taxes and legally resident in the UK. Then I was voting. Um, when I started to be uh, an employee here in Belgium, um, paying my taxes here locally um, and voting for local and regional and, and, and national government here that affected my life directly here, then I wasn't voting in UK elections because my feeling is, well, I'm not paying taxes there. I'm not affected by the, um, I'm not affected by those decisions in the same direct way. Uh, so it's not fair that I should be voting for that. However, the referendum is a bit different because that really does have a direct impact on me. It has a very direct impact on uh, the rights that I have to live here as a citizen of the European Union. It has a direct effect on the rights that my children have, and it has, and it's not just about voting but, uh, and, and, and citizenship, but it's all kinds of practical things like healthcare and social security and all of that kind of thing. So I feel that that's an area where um, the referendum will have a direct impact on me, and I think it's fair that I would have a vote in that circumstance. During my journey, I was accepted to come to NATO's headquarters in Brussels to meet three British expats. Sadly, on the occasion, I was not allowed to bring a video camera, but I was permitted to bring only an audio microphone. Here are the interviews from my visit to NATO. In the context of the broader, not just military, security and defence uh, dimension, would the alliance be strengthened, weakened or unaffected by a British withdrawal from the European Union? And how would you see a British withdrawal from the EU affect how NATO works over the long term? Well, of course, um, you know, in any community of democracies, uh, the people get to have a vote. That, that's cru cru uh, crucial. And, and countries obviously determine their own future. And uh, uh, we in NATO go around obviously saying to the Russians that countries like Georgia uh, and Ukraine 
uh, have the right to determine their own future, whether that be NATO membership, EU membership, that's a fundamental right. So obviously when it comes to NATO countries already in the alliance, we have to respect the same principle. Countries can determine their own future. Uh, there's nothing that says that you have to stay in a, an alliance or an organisation uh, 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 forever. It, it, we're only strong to the extent that uh, membership reflects a democratic choice and we go around obviously all the time seeking public support uh, for NATO membership. So uh, the first principle of course is that this is a choice clearly uh, on June the 23rd uh, for, for the British people and the British people uh, uh, alone. Having said that uh, and speaking entirely personal, as I, uh, personally as I said at the beginning of our talk I, I come from this generation from the 1970s which was very enthusiastic uh, about EU membership, overcoming Britain's sort of traditional uh, isolationism, adjusting to the fact that the empire was no longer there, that we were now a, a European country, and that our future was with our European neighbours and friends on the other side of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the channel. Uh, and looking back over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, to my mind, it's been a, a massive a success story. I think the UK has made the EU considerably uh, stronger, uh, more open, uh, less protectionist, uh, with a stronger foreign uh, a common foreign policy, for example, more influential in the world. Uh, but I think also uh, EU membership has transformed the UK. I mean, the quality of coffee in London, uh, you know, the, 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 the mixture now of, uh, of cultures and populations, uh, uh, the quality of the food. No, in, in so many ways, the number of Brits who have uh, homes in, in Europe and, and travel in both directions. Uh, so to my mind, it, it's been a good success story for uh, both sides. Um, we in NATO, frankly, uh, look to the EU now uh, to be our security partner because we realise that in dealing with many situations, we can't do it alone. Uh, we don't have all the instruments we need. For example, if we're looking at hybrid warfare, what do we do to stop a country like Russia destabilising us through uh, media campaigns, cyber attacks, uh, potentially sabotage of critical uh, infrastructure? We don't have all of the instruments in NATO to deal with that situation. Uh, the EU does. Uh, so, therefore, uh, it's not a question of, you know, a weak EU is good for a stronger NATO or a weaker NATO is good for a strong EU. No, it doesn't work that way at all. Uh, we need the EU as our partner to have that full range of instruments, whether it's you know, helping the Libyans out now with their national unity government, the interventions that you mentioned earlier where the EU often provides the civilian uh, reconstruction, dealing with these hybrid warfare scenarios. So if uh, a UK exit from the EU would considerably weaken the EU, as well as Britain, as I personally believe it would, that's not good news for uh, NATO in terms of our ability to meet our own uh, security challenges. Out of the thousand or so international staff at NATO, given that Britain and France are two major European military member states, how many British staff are there and given the debates about the under-representation of Britons in the EU institutions, is Britain overrepresented or underrepresented, or is in the proportion of staff per member state just about right in NATO? Um, well, I, I haven't seen the, the, the um, uh, recent figures, the 2015-16 figures for NATO, but certainly a couple of years ago, um, uh, the UK represented somewhere between 10-12% uh, of the NATO staff. So actually, I think that's quite a healthy number, and that sounds about right to me. So I think the UK is actually quite well represented in NATO, uh, and that is a range of, of uh, ex-armed forces, military people like me, uh, policy people, people that have actually grown up in the NATO structure. Um, you talked to Dr Jamie Shea before, and he's been here many years more than me. So you can see we represent different sides of that uh, Brit representation in NATO. So I think there's quite a healthy uh, representation uh, in NATO uh, as far as the UK is concerned. Uh, and as I said right at the beginning, you can see that clearly is isolated, you know, irrespective of the, of the EU, pretend the EU doesn't exist, uh, then then on its own, um, the UK does have a good setup here in NATO, a good broad range of experience. I have lots of colleagues who have a similar background and lots of colleagues here who have a, who've spent longer here, you know, a similar time to, to, to Dr. Shea. Um, so there's a good balance in terms of numbers, and I think the UK is pretty well represented here in NATO. Would British um, 
next stuff be affected in any way by withdrawal from the EU, and if so, how? Well, you would think, um, you know, at first thought they, they wouldn't be affected because I said NATO is separate to the EU as an organisation, so why should they be affected? But actually, if you dig a bit deeper than that, um, uh, I think you'd probably find that there would be effects. I mean, the simple effect that actually there's a, there's a fairly sizable British expat community here in Brussels. Yes. People know each other in EU and NATO, and, and actually, in terms of, uh, you know, um, furthering security, uh, we should be doing some more so on a professional front, but but on a f uh, family front, on a socialising front, and the general exchange of views and getting to know people. Actually, there's a big support to the UK community here in Brussels, and and if and the majority of that is based on the EU, not not on NATO. Yeah. So I guess if the EU were to go, then you know NATO, there would be NATO people whose uh, spouses would suddenly lose their jobs, whose children would they'd be debating whether to move them back to the UK or keep them here in Brussels. There'd be a, a fall off in the in the UK community and the, and the support it gives both to NATO and EU staff. So these are kind of intangible things, I think, that are difficult to grasp exactly what the arguments there would be. Mm. Um, but, but, but I think it's, you know, it's not the simple answer that NATO and the EU are separate, so there wouldn't be any impact, uh, there wouldn't be any direct loss to UK jobs here in NATO. But actually, the, the, some of those second and third order impacts, I think, will be quite substantial. And, uh, and it's difficult to think through what those would be. Especially there are about over 28,000 British expats living in Belgium at the moment. So in terms for each individual family, it really depends on the result, it, really, what happens. Exactly. I mean, it wouldn't personally, it wouldn't affect me because I have a family in the UK and I'm just based here, you know, as a single person that goes back home every couple of weekends or so. But that is not the common case. I mean, there are others like me, but a lot more have family ties here in NATO. And it, it's quite normal to find somebody who's, who you know, works in NATO and their spouse works in the EU or vice versa, or who moved from NATO to the EU and then back again as Brits. So, so actually the, uh, the the relationship between the NATO and the EU, as far as Brits are concerned, is far more complicated than, uh, than just seeing them as two separate organisations. So will your message to the young uh, Cardiff and Welsh vote to be to vote in this referendum? Absolutely. You should use a vote and base your vote on what you find out about the facts of what would happen if we stay in or if we leave. Just get the facts and vote. You must vote. For me, the economy and jobs and growth and so on are important. That's what I do day by day and I work with businesses all the time. So inevitably a lot of the arguments that, that I make are about those things. They're about business, they're about the economy, they're about jobs. That's not what the European Union is about entirely. The European Union is much more about being part of the world. It's about the opportunities to uh, to engage with different people, to learn new things, to experience different cultures and different opportunities. Uh, first of all, by having access to the rest of Europe, but also because what the European Union does is gives us a way of engaging with the rest of the world. And much of the, the opportunities that we have to engage with the rest of the world, to go work, live in other countries and so on, are also encouraged and protected by the, the, the importance of the European Union as a, uh, as a trading uh, and political organisation relating to the rest of the world. So uh, that's, that's much more than jobs in the economy, although that is of course really important. For me, it's much more about being part of the world uh, socially, culturally and intellectually. Yes, I think it's important that young voters should vote. My message to them would be, although you're busy with lots of other fun things in your lives, it will impact your futures. It is important to engage 
and you can get yourselves an advantage if you know what's going on. And personally, I was hopeless as a young person and totally disengaged. But if I could have my time again, if I paid a bit more attention to what was going on around me than just immediately what was in front of my nose, I might have made a few different decisions in life. So I would say get engaged, listen, learn as much as you can and vote. Well, of course, absolutely. It's, it's, it's important to, to go out and vote in every single election. I don't think I've ever missed an, uh, an election, in, uh, except on, on a couple of occasions where I was on holiday by mistake. <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's, it's very important, and, and this referendum is, is perhaps more important than, than anything you, you, you can... Uh, any other referendum or, or election you're likely to participate in. So, yes, it's very, very important they should go out and vote. Uh, it, it's, it's extremely important for the future of Wales and it's extremely important for their futures, for their careers and for their families. So uh, please do vote. Rodri Thomas, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Andrew, it's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr Glenvon, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you very much. So now you've heard all the arguments from each individual, it's now your time, young voters of Cardiff, to make your minds up and vote for this once-in-a-lifetime EU referendum that will change their lives for everyone, whether Britain will still be in the European Union or it will leave for once and for all. I'm Arthur Huxham, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.